We've had the great fortune of featuring some truly extraordinary women on Impact Theory, and in this very special episode, we'll share some of the most powerful lessons they've learned on their journey to success. These inspiring women have exceeded what the world has told them they can be and achieve, and whether we're talking about an athlete like Kerry Walsh Jennings, a business magnet like Sarah Rob O'Hagan, or an inspirational powerhouse like Mel Robbins, each of these women have stories worth telling and lessons worth listening to really, really closely. And if you want to succeed, whether in business or in life, pay attention. I know I did. So good to have you on the oh show. Oh my gosh, thank you. I, you know, you called me the master of motivation, and I think motivation is complete garbage, so maybe we should start there. That is a perfect <laughs> place to start. So I totally agree with you, but why you do? do you say that? I do 100%. Now, I said that in the spirit of I know what you're trying to do, so it is meant with absolute um, reverence, uh -huh. but why do you say that it's garbage? Well, um, and we'll, we'll talk a lot about this, but... Um, I think it's garbage because at some point we all bought into this lie that you got to feel ready in order to change. Yeah. We bought into this, this complete falsehood that at some point you're going to have the courage. At some point you're mm -hmm. going to have the confidence. And it's total bullshit, frankly. I don't, are we allowed to swear on this Absolutely. show? Okay. Um, it's, it's complete garbage. And so there are so many people in the world and, and, and you know, you may be watching this right now and you have these incredible ideas and what you think is missing is motivation. Mm. And that's not true because the way that our minds are wired and the fact about human beings is that we are not designed to do things that are uncomfortable or scary or difficult. Mm. Our brains are designed to protect us from those things because our brains are trying to keep us alive. And in order to change, in order to build a business, in order to be the best parent, the best spouse, to do all those things that you know you want to do with your life, with your work, with your dreams, you're going to have to do things that are difficult, uncertain, or scary, which sets up this problem for all of us. You're never going to feel like it. Motivation's garbage. You, you only feel motivated to do the things that are easy, right? Why do you think that is? Oh, I know exactly why that is. Because I, I, I've studied this so much because for me, one of the hardest things to figure out was why is it so hard to do the little things mm -hmm. that would improve my life? And what I've come to realize and what we'll talk a lot about today is that the way that our minds are designed is our minds are designed to stop you at all costs from doing anything that might hurt you. Mm. And the way that, 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 that this all happens is it all starts with something super subtle that none of us ever catch. And that is with this habit that all of us have that nobody's talking about. We all have a habit of hesitating. Mm. You can truly trace every single problem or complaint in your life to silence and hesitation. Those are decisions. Wow. And what I do and what's changed my life is waking up and realizing that motivation's garbage. I'm never going to feel like doing the things that are tough or difficult or uncertain or scary or new. So I need to stop waiting until I feel like it. Mm. And number two, I am one decision away from a totally different marriage, a totally different life, a totally different job, a totally different income, a totally different uh, relationship with my kids. Your life comes down to your decisions. And if you change your decisions, you will change everything. But I know the next question is gonna be, so how do I find the right path? What, what is that process? Yeah, you know, for me, I went through this phase where I just stopped saying no to things. So when I first started YouTube, I thought, okay, I'm, I'm opening the gates up to this new platform and this new type of creation I've never done before. But I've also started going to shows more often. I started to meet different types of people. I think a big part of finding out what's right for you is stop confining yourself to a path that you've been convinced is the path. This, what I'm doing right now, is nowhere on the path for a young Indian girl that's a part of my family. Like, this is nowhere on the path. It was very much so go to school and get married and have kids, and that's a success. If, you, if you're able to have those kids and give my mom some grandkids, you're successful. And I think it's about 
really stepping outside of that and exploring, whether that's in school and taking classes that you might not take at first glance, whether it's going and experiencing different types of arts, meeting different types of people, making new friends. I think there's so much out there that you don't even know exists. And I'm a testament to that. I make videos on the internet. Mm -hmm. Ask my mom if she thought that could have been a job when she was growing up. You know, so I think it's all about just really getting out there and seeing what's available. And so then what are the signs that somebody should look for to know that, okay, this is something that resonates? I think, I, okay, I love sleep. I just need to emphasize, I love sleep. But there's some mornings when I wake up and I'm like, I don't even care how tired I am. I'm so excited about this day. So I think being excited to wake up. Also, you'll just see it in your energy, I think, as well. The little pep in your step I have when I'm walking to set is really telling. Also, the people you surround yourself with. I think when you start to get surrounded by people, um, and my team is a great example of this, that really bring out the best in you, and you feel yourself growing and learning, and maybe you're a little more patient or a little more creative, or you think about things a little differently, any type of evolution like that, I think, is definitely signs you're doing the right thing. Mm. You know, this, this entire career path has been everything but comfortable. No part of it's comfortable. So even on the days when I come home and I think, that was horrible, that audition was horrible. I can literally feel part of me evolving as like, okay, but you did it and now you know for the next one, what to do, you'll know what to expect for the next one. And those scary things are all signs that you're doing the right thing, because you're growing. <laughs>
man, I mean, that's been a question for how many years at this point? But it's really, it, we've come a long way, but it's really just more and more. It's women standing up, but it's also men standing up. Um, you know, it's everyone regardless of, of making sure that, you know, prize purses for women are the same across genders. You see some sports where men get $100,000 and women get $50,000 mm. for winning the same freaking race. Like, I don't get it. And so that is something that there needs to be there needs to be a constant dialogue about it, um, and unfortunately, you know, we're still not there, but we're getting there. So I know decorum is going to force you to give me a really humble answer to this <laughs> question, and, and I'll maybe push you a bit. But what do you think your impact has been by you beat the vast majority of the men that you race against? I mean, the vast majority. Mm -hmm. So do you think that's helping? Do we need more people that are playing at that level that can really show up and and dazzle? Quite frankly. What I would want the impact to be is to start to normalize that conversation because people will say, oh my God, yeah, they, oh my God, she got second overall or she, she won that 50K outright. Like it's some crazy strange thing. Mm. And that's great. It brings attention to it. But with, if we keep thinking about that as an outlier, it's not going to shift. We need to be like, look, dude, that woman won. That's awesome. That's cool. That's a woman won outright. And if we can normalize that, then that's when I think we've really made progress. What do you think is, has been the secret to your success? Mm -hmm. And one thing I'd love you to touch on is you've said, I never saw myself as a, a great female executive. I was just mm. the best executive. Yeah. <laughs> so one, why, how do you not fall into that? Mm. And then two, like what makes a great, great executive? executive? I come from New Zealand and we, many people may not know, were the first country in the world to give women the vote. Really? 30 years before the United States. Wow, I didn't. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> and I have wondered, is that why, as a woman, I grew up with a set of different cultural um, guardrails? Because I remember coming to America and discovering what Title IX was. And I was like, why would you need something like that? Like, it just never occurred to me growing up that, as a female, I couldn't do anything that I wanted to do. And and it's, it's funny, I think now for women, I, I give Sheryl Sandberg clearly so much credit and love for what she's done to start this conversation on, you know, what we need to do to get more women into leadership roles. Um, and I feel like sometimes we can get all of the data in our way and use that almost as a reason to not take the step because like there's so much incredibly real data that says that you, you know, are not going to get funded in the same way as a guy will. You, you won't, you know. So you've just got to almost say, those are today's circumstances, but they're not a reason not to change and move it forward. And, and I think for me, I just have worked in predominantly male industries the whole way through. And it just, I've never even really noticed that I was the only woman at the table very often. I just was like, well, fuck, I'm here. And so <laughs> I'm going to do the best I can. And, and it's up to me to outperform my peer group, whoever they are. And the place that I want to start is actually the dedication to your book, which I shouldn't have been surprised by, but for some reason I was. And I'll paraphrase, it was to all the girls out there who have big dreams, think bigger, work harder. And I thought, whoa, why, why think bigger, why work harder? You know, I think for me, there were so many times in my life that I was told no. I was told I wasn't good enough. I wasn't strong enough. Um, I wasn't fast enough. I was too skinny. Um, so many things where people just didn't believe in me. Um, and I think, you know, I owe a lot to my parents, which I'm sure we'll get into, but I just feel like they truly taught me to believe in my dreams. And I had this huge dream of, you know, winning that all around gold medal at the Olympics. And not many people believed in me, but when I was able to kind of set that dream and that goal 
And I knew it was like this huge goal that, you know, for so many years for an American gymnast, it was unattainable and unachievable. So Mary Lou Retton won in 1984. And then one of my closest friends and teammates, Carly Patterson, won in 2004. So it had been 20 years before an American gymnast wow. won. And so being able to train in the same gym as Carly, the gym that my parents um, started, was was really something that inspired me every single day because she kind of made me believe that this is possible. You know, it is possible for an American gymnast to do that. Um, and so I think just being able to see that every single day inspired me. That being said, I just feel like so many times... There's people around you, whether they're in your life or now with social media, you know, people are always going to tell you no and people are always going to like roll your eyes when you tell them your dream or your goal. And I think what I realized throughout my career and continue to realize is that those dreams and those goals are within reach and they're, you know, just at the tip of our fingertips. And if we really want to do it, it's it's far beyond obviously than just like work hard and believe in yourself. You know, you have to do a few more things in between all of that. But um, I just think with young girls today that it's important for them to have a voice and to believe in that voice. So talking about your frame of mind, which I found really, really interesting, and, and you've talked about it saying, I have something else. It isn't just the work ethic. In fact, I'm gonna paraphrase, but this is gonna be really close. Everyone that plays tennis has work ethic, so that isn't what yeah. separated me from everybody else. What separated me from everybody else was that other thing. What is that other thing? Mm. I always think there are, um, there are things that just can't be measured. Like, you know, I don't know if they're in thin air or they're on another planet or what, but like they're, and a lot of sports are measured by numbers. So you have statistics and you have all the point percentages and like I'll talk to my coach and he'll show me actual patterns of a player or um, where they serve. So I'm aware of it in a match and all that is important. But when you're deep in a, in a match or you're deep in a third set, like so much is, you, you rely so or I do, on my mind and what I believe is right in that moment and my instinct and whether it's the repetition that I formed with all the years that I've played or it's the discipline that I've that I've formed um, or it's just the experience that will kick in um, you know numbers are important and you must rely on them but there are things that like you don't I mean Andre Agassi had this goal you don't have to be better than everyone else in the draw when you go out on the court like you have to be better than someone that's across the net and whether that is at a very high level, whether that's at a low level, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. You can't, can't be great every single day. Like there's only a handful of times where I've gone on the court and felt like I did everything well. You know, it's impossible. Well, I got to this place in my life where people say like, you know, what are one of the biggest lessons you've learned? And to me, it's like not to compare myself to others because that's just the recipe for failure, right? I'm never going to be you. I'm never going to be as articulate or passionate or convey myself like you do. I'm never going to have Misty May's hand or her ball control. And I, for so long, I compared myself against the greats and be like, fuck, I'm falling short. Like I need to become them to become great, which is just bullshit, you know? And once I stopped you know, honestly comparing myself and owning myself and being inspired by them and stealing all the best parts of them and making it my own, like that is so much more powerful, you know? And so I want to do that for the rest of my life. And I, 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 I'm not a literal person, you know? Like I think there's all shades of gray and life is a fucking rainbow and it's not black and white and thank God because I am like an in the moment person and I could contradict myself from one to the next, but I'm not bullshitting. Like it's my truth and this is my experience. And I believe that we're always in flux and we're always expanding, you know? So please take me with a grain of salt, but know that I mean my shit. You know, it's like this weird, like there's so many dichotomies in me and I feel like sometimes I'm nonsensical, but I know what the fuck I want and I know who I am and I know that what I want is gonna help me to become more of, I, of what I am. I'll ask that question before where I was going. How do you identify or cultivate or whatever that word is, the truest version of yourself? Sure. But just to piggyback on what you just said, my work seems to be about the parent-child relationship, mm. but it's really about healing the, the child within the parent. 
And in that respect, it's for every human being. I will agree Because every that. human being is a child. So it's in the, um, under the umbrella and the guise of the parent wanting to pick up the book because it's about the child. But when they pick it up and they realize this is about how they have to yet confront who it is they truly are. So to your question, how do you develop the truest self? Well, most of us have been divorced from it. This is just the, the tragic truth for the reasons I said. We've been given a prescription. We've been raised through a conditioned lens, not a lens that truly honors who it is we are. So in order to now recover that, we have to peel back the layers. We have to undo all that has been done to us. So we have to re-question all that we should have never been given answers to and we should have been allowed to discover on our own, such as who is God? What is God? What is religion? What is beauty? What is achievement? What is success? What is truth? Right? Those questions, those big life questions should have been led to us, not given to us. We should have been led to discover them. They should not have been given to us packaged because maybe they don't work for us. And it is through the discovery of those answers that we discover who it is we are and we discover our relationship with the universe. So we are robbing our children of this valuable process by handing them this list. All we need to do really is just to guide them. And the most essential thing we need to do is discover those answers for ourselves and value the sovereign right to muddle and fumble and stumble and mess up. Because when we value it and see how much it's given us, we let our children suffer, we let our children fumble because we know where it's gonna take them because we saw where it took us. This is the greatest lesson for parents, to, to realize the power of pain and our desire to fix it for our children and to control it because we're trying to mitigate and control it for ourselves, but we've never been able to. But this is the universe's biggest lesson. You have to surrender. Life is pain. Life is unpredictable. It's, it's a curveball. It's a crapshoot. It's an adventure. And if you don't live it waking up every day saying, maybe this is the day I will fully give it all up and change and start anew. We're so afraid to mold the skin. Mm. We're so afraid. So we'd much rather live in the conformity of stagnancy, you know, as long as we remain the same, you know, it's much easier. But life is not that, you know, so all spiritual lessons of the mystics are ever present in this potential of this moment, you know, and our children show us that. We're just afraid. Pain is the greatest teacher. It doesn't mean you self-flagellate and self-inflict. It just means you, you don't hold yourself back in the fear of it. You just live fully. You talked about having scar tissue from growing up and you, you maybe downplayed it a little bit here in your book and in some of your talks, you've talked a lot about like not having the TV, parents with accents, always being, because your parents were moving, you moved like an insane number of times. Yeah, 12 times. So moving around so much to stay in essentially wealthy neighborhoods so that you could go to the best public schools and that you know kids can be really, really cruel. So going through that and then coming out of it, I think that breaks most people. Why didn't it break you? What were you saying to yourself mentally? Because I'm sure at the time you weren't thinking, oh, this is really going to make me a great entrepreneur. You know, <laughs> you're just trying to get through it. But what were you telling yourself to get through it? And I think for me, my refuge was in helping other people. I started doing community service in high school. And for me, it was this refuge. Maybe seeing people who had it even worse than me put my own suffering in context. Maybe it made me feel like I could somehow transform hurt and pain that I was feeling into something positive in the world. You know, looking back on it, I feel like maybe that was the original impetus for me to do this work. Do you have magic words for somebody who's going through something similar, but their response is to close down? It's not to open up. They're not being propelled forward. They're being held back. Because I've met people that they fall into both camps, like really similar circumstances, but just diametrically opposed responses. Like, do you have the, the magic sentence that you know, would help somebody jump from closing down to opening up? The only real power we have in the world is choosing our response. We can't choose what happens to us. We can get stuck into situations where we are abused, where we are not treated fairly, um, where any number of bad things can happen. And so the only choice we can make is how to respond. And I find that that knowledge gives me so much freedom because if something bad is happening to me that I can say is beyond my control, I can say, well, at least, you know, I have the power in my response to show the world what kind of person I am. 
And I can't tell you the number of really interesting examples of post-traumatic growth that we're now cataloging. People who've lost everything, people who've had their kids murdered in front of them, people who've had just every man manner of hardship who are able to choose their response. And rather than shutting down and, you know, getting more and more depressed, um, which is something that you have to get through. But the, the choice to take that painful experience and mold it into something positive for the world is I think the deepest kind of healing we can have as humans. And for me, I think part of what got me through those tough times, um, eventually as I matured, was the knowledge that I had transformed that into something good for the world. You know, the classic Silicon Valley CEO. Um, you know, I think that for me, I used to believe that that meant that I could never really achieve what they achieved, that there were certain parts of the world, certain um, levels of success, certain um, levels of business that were just going to be too big for me. It's like, how could I dare say I'm going to run an energy company? Mm. Like, that I'm going to build wealth for a community. Like, right. who, who the hell am I? Um, how did you get over that? Because I think most people yeah. have that, but they stop there. The first thing that I did was not think too far ahead. So the idea was, instead of imagining from day one, oh, I want to build an energy company, it was more imagining or really envisioning, well, why am I getting up in the morning? Why am I, you know, what's the point of my day? Especially also, I think I would add too, recently, wanting very much to make sure that little girls who look like me believe that they can do anything yeah. um, and believe that they can do more than just media and entertainment in particular and believe in the value of their perspective. And so that's what gets me up in the morning. And then everything else, the details, is like it kind of, I can push through that day. And what I found is that instead of trying to live a successful life, if you aim to have a successful day, you know, just, you know, 12, if you have 13 out of the 24 hours of your day, if you won those hours, um, you won the day. And if you win most of the days in a week, you won the week. You know, we're, we just need a simple majority here, right? <laughs> and if you, and if you, if you win, you know, most of the weeks in a month, there you go. Most of the months in a year, most of the years in a stops. life. And, and all of a sudden, look at that. Without even trying, you've been able to kind of get somewhere. And so... The, the biggest roadblocks for me were kind of in those big momentous moments then. So like getting ready to raise the round, for example, was one of those big moments where I realized that without knowing it, I had been building a life up to this big leap. But, but it, it wasn't about starting there thinking about the leaps, thinking about the big momentous things that would have to happen. It's like you just go hour by hour, day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year. And then all of a sudden, five years into working on something, I have the opportunity to raise the largest round any black woman's ever raised in history. And I'm afraid. I'm afraid. Despite everything I've gone through to get there, I'm afraid. And it's because I still am just like, yo, I know me and Mark Zuckerberg went to the same college, but that's about it. I was on the step team. I know he wasn't. You know what I mean? Like, like yeah, I mean, I, I mean, from what I understand, he wasn't. I don't, you know, but like we we have different, we have a different life. And I know that ultimately these investors are looking to invest in people that they understand, right? I think actually a lot of people, I don't think I'm special in that. I think people like to understand things. Um, and in the worst of times in my business, if they don't understand me, they're not, they're not gonna understand my decisions. They're not going to have faith in how I'm going to get us through this. Right. And it was actually this person who's currently one of my advisors, works for one of the top VCs uh, out here on the West Coast. And he said, without missing a beat, Jessica, Mark Zuckerberg could have never invented the socket. Uh, you know, it is your life, it is your unique perspective, it is who you are that has brought you here. So anyone who invests in you is going to want you to be who you are. They're going to have to trust that being who you are, even if it's different from who they are, um, that that's going to be the thing that's going to take this to the next level, no matter what. Um, and I think for me, that was, that was the critical piece of advice, right? Like we all need someone to say the thing that's been so obvious, but we've just been too head down to, to realize. But in the end, you know, it's about recognizing the value in our own struggle, uh, being appreciative 
and aware of our privilege um, so that we can have empathy for others and their experience. It can, we can bridge the gap for them. Um, and then being able to take all of that and own it. Say, this is who, can we curse? Can I curse? No. Go for it, let's get crazy. I'll try not to though. Trust me, <laughs> I'm not gonna try not yeah. to, so jump um, in the water's warm. But yeah, no, I mean like, this is who the fuck I am. There you go. This is who I am. Hello, who to who you are and to who you are, that's great, but this is who the fuck I am. Right. Take it or leave it, like, I know that no matter what happens, if I stay who I am, like, I will, I will feel good about it at the end of the day. You know, that's all, the only thing that's going to be constant in this ever-changing world, especially in the startup space, is who I am. And so, in really meditating on that, and thinking, okay, you know what? I don't know what's gonna happen with this round. I don't know what's gonna happen with this company, but I do know who I am. Let's double down. I hope that you guys enjoyed that episode as much as I did. I was blown away by all the amazing inspiration and quite frankly, usable tactics that these powerhouse women shared with us. And one more time, I just wanna thank every one of the extraordinary women that have come on this show and shared what they've learned, not only to inspire us, but I think inspire an entire generation coming up behind them. So to each and every one of you, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for coming on. I am eternally grateful, and I think I speak for all of us when I say that we all are. So thank you, and if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe, and until next time, my friends, be legendary. Take care. All right, guys, thank you so much for joining me for that. I hope that you got as much out of those incredibly gifted women as I did. So much amazing stuff is coming out of female leaders right now, and that's why recently we launched a new show called Women of Impact. It's hosted by my amazingly talented wife, Lisa Bilyeu. She talks all about how she went from being a housewife to being a full-blown entrepreneur as part of the founding team that built a billion-dollar company, Quest, and now here at Impact Theory. If you want to hear her and other extraordinary women talk Talking about their experiences go right now to YouTube and to Instagram. It's Women of Impact.